The following program was made possible by funding from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. Eric, why, why does the environmental community, and particularly Audubon of Florida, have any interest at all in renewable energy? Well, Ernie, that's a, that's a question that, that has got to be addressed to everyone who cares about the water and wildlife uh, of Florida and cares about this beautiful state. I, I would summarize it with three things. One is that we have a beautiful state. We need to protect it, and that means we need a different energy policy. Second, we've got to worry about the climate. Uh, problem for the world and doing our part. And the third thing is, uh, is the horrible oil spill that we're looking at right now and the effect of that and what that's going to do to our state and understand the relationship between that oil spill uh, and, and, and the, our energy future. Because, you know, we, we are culpable on that too. It's not just BP. It is our, our thirst for fossil fuel is a transportation source of fuel and electric power source of fuel that's helped create that problem. You know, I flew over that oil spill yesterday on the way here, and uh, it, is, it is unbelievable when you actually see it with your, with your own eyes. You're not just looking at video, just miles and miles and miles of thick mats of oil floating on the Gulf of Mexico, that highly productive and beautiful estuary. And the day before, I was on uh, the beaches uh, on northwest Florida and, um, and uh, Mississippi, and... Uh, it is, it is very disturbing to uh, have to see those mats of uh, tar on the beach and to see bird colonies you know, right next to them. So if we're going to balance, um, if we're going to balance our energy future with the need to protect uh, the blessings that we've been given as a, as a coastal state, uh, as a state that depends on tourism, and that's very important for us, ecotourism, I'm in that business, then we need to make sure that we've got renewable energy as part of our energy future. And uh, I'm glad to see that you've organized this conference. I think that's what we're here to discuss. And I think this question of not, not uh, what, uh, but just how soon can we get it done? Because there's no time to lose. I've got a question for Melissa, which actually follows up a little bit on Senator Herodopoulos' question to us at the end of the first panel discussion. And that relates uh, somewhat to environmental permitting, but also the question of water and water policy in Florida. How does that relate to uh, renewable energy and also the question of are there current permitting hurdles that maybe we could take a look at? How long do I have? You have three minutes. I know. Okay. I'll, I'll give you, you know, four if you're nice. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting. I think everyone in the room would agree that moving forward with alternative energy is the right thing to do. But even the right thing has secondary impacts um, on the environment that we need to take into consideration. And a lot of the concerns that you've heard, whether you're talking about energy crops and the water consumption associated with that, or solar fields, some of the things that you may not think about is that that does create a stormwater problem that has to be dealt with. Um, oftentimes, the solar fields are proposed in areas with wetlands or with threatened and endangered species, so we need to worry, worry about gopher tortoises and different things like that. So, you know, I think the permitting process is in place for a good reason because we do have some concerns, nothing that we can't deal with. My staff and staff throughout the state of Florida work elsewhere on solar projects and wind projects um, because we don't really have that much going on here. We'd like to change that, going back to the first panel. Um, but we, we can get through the, we know how to address those environmental concerns and make projects that really are a win-win for, for uh, what we're trying to accomplish. I think there are a couple things, though, as we look at new solar fields and the power plant siding rule, which is a... It, the intent behind the power plant siting rule was very important in that it consolidated permitting as we look at new energy sources. Some of the challenges we have as you look at solar is really the only thing that's technically required is a ERP permit uh, with the core in the state. So you're looking at wetland impacts, stormwater impacts. Again, do you need to go through the entire power plant siting? And the key thing on that, I think, is need and that need justification. So that's a key thing that I think we need to address as we move forward. If you want utilities to be proactive 
Um, but you also want them to document a need right now. I think you, you get into some challenges. Again, we want them to explore alternative energy. Um, the other thing, again, is the stormwater. Just thinking about it, you think of a solar field as being, um, you know, our stormwater rules are basically, they treat the solar field the same as if it was an industrial building or a large building. So none of that area is able to absorb stormwater. You know intuitively that the the ones that move anyway, there's grass growing underneath. I mean, it's, it's definitely um, able to contain its stormwater. Forcing them to address and create stormwater ponds creates a, a challenge in terms of how much uh, production can we actually get versus how much space is then wasted. I think we have some real opportunities that hopefully we'll get to on the panel in terms of combining project needs, um, which hopefully we'll get to. So I think those are some of the key things on the permitting side. We can uh, deal with them, but there are some things that we could certainly make um, easier to cope with. I wrote, I wrote a little note for Senator Herodopoulos about okay. this Power Plant Siting uh, Act. That's a, a very specific one that maybe we could, we could address. Uh, let me continue on, on kind of the water side with, uh, with Joe Collins' uh, service on the Water Management District Board. And, and if you could talk a little bit about uh, some, of the, some of the thoughts you have as both a landowner uh, representative and uh, in the governing board as to both biofuels uh, bio crops and uh, other types of renewable energy. Okay, sure. Um, biofuels, first of all, you, you can't really talk about biofuels in the state of Florida without uh, mentioning uh, Commissioner Charlie Bronson and certainly want to thank him for his leadership on farm to fuel and uh, really being a recognized national leader uh, when, when, when it comes to biofuels. Whether you're talking about um, biodiesel, from Jatropa or algae even, the um, potential there is extraordinary. Um, or cellulosic ethanol from some of the uh, tropical grasses and different energy canes and different energy crops that, uh, that, that we're just seeing uh, extraordinary potential from. Um, especially from a water resource perspective, uh, there are there, there are a few things there that, that are very promising. Just the irrigation technology is uh, advancing rapidly. We have GPS-controlled irrigation systems now um, that are just leading the way in, in water conservation. Um, our citrus industry is under attack from a lot of different areas for uh, diseases and pests and things like that. And there's a lot of existing developed water resources and farmland that are out there that some of these uh, alternative energy crops um, are, 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 I think, going to provide a great, great promise uh, for, for some of those existing uh, farmlands. One of the truly exciting things, though, about being on the ground floor of a developing industry is really being able to select the right crops for our region. What works here in Florida is not going to be what works in the Midwest or, or the West or, or the Northeast. We have an extraordinary growing machine here in our climate, and that's what we've got to take advantage of through our research at our universities, um, is selecting the right crops. Um, the things that drive uh, our agricultural crops and our practices for food are totally different than, than what, what we're seeing in our non-food-based crops that we're, that we're talking about for fuel. If you're growing watermelons, you've got a specific, you know, if you're lucky, three-week window in Florida that you've got to hit. And that drives a lot of your decision makings on water resources um, and uh, crop protection products, a lot of those kind of things. But when you're growing a crop for energy production, particularly in, in, in the cellulosic energy um, area, you're using the entire plant, the, the, you know, from, from the ground all the way up. So if there's a few weeds in there or, or there's some blemishes on it or those kind of things, those are not concerns of yours anymore because you're taking that whole plant um, in, in, into the mill to be uh, uh, t turned into to energy. And so a lot of those decision makings and practices that we use for food crops, just you know, we're just not bound by that for for energy crops, and that all translates back into the water inputs, the nutrient inputs, and all those things have you know just a very 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 positive impact on the environment. And that's that's what's the most promising thing to me, and exciting thing to me is 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 to select the right crops that use less water, that use less inputs, and that's what's going to make us successful in Florida. Yeah, thank you, thank you. 
Um, Susan, let me ask a question for you. you uh, the, uh, the question of, of developing a low carbon economy and, and the effects that may have upon the environment, some specific uh, suggestions that we might have for Senator Herodopoulos. How, how do you develop that low carbon economy for Florida? Well, the low carbon economy is a tremendous opportunity and the environmental benefit is, is, is multifold, really. I mean, first, the obvious, we'd be reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So there are implications. Florida is really on sort of the front line, ground zero with sea level rise and a no whole number of issues that relate uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. But, but even then, when we move away, for instance, from coal burning power plants, the National Academy of Sciences did a study in 2009, and Florida spends well over $900 million a year on the public health implications of coal. 369 come from the Crystal River uh, coal power plant alone, just so you can give an idea of that cost. So I really want to sort of push back on this, what I consider is a cost myth when people talk about this costs more. We have to begin to look at life cycle costs when we're uh, making all kinds of decisions, whether it's a new locomotive for tri-rail and looking at the long-term cost of that, or whether it's the upfront cost, because you were asking about that earlier, is the upfront cost, so we need to look over the long term. And Professor Swallow made a number of good points in the previous panel about the cost of doing nothing. So our electricity is going up 4.7% a year. So whether we talk about the Jim King Energy Bill that was actually a renewable portfolio standard, an actual target for renewables that would build a market that, that actually passed the Senate, of course, uh, two years ago, um, they put a 2% rate impact on that, or excuse me, a rate cap. So 2% and people were sort of making a lot of noise about that. Well, if our bills are already going up almost 5%, I think that there isn't a person on the planet that wouldn't prefer to spend 2% to do clean renewable that actually creates jobs in Florida. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists just did a report, and we spend one point, we send $1.56 billion every year out of Florida for the cost of coal. $300 million of that goes to Columbia. So by, by looking at reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, by putting a cap, and the one key point that I want to mention is this issue of certainty. And that's why we need a renewable portfolio standard rather than just something that's voluntary, because that's a lot of people have been talking about the bill that passed the House. Well, that was completely voluntary. So yes, it might help one or two companies, or, but it's not going to create that robust market that we need to build a business cluster up and down the supply chain. So we really need that certainty. And it's the same thing at the federal level. When we have a price signal on carbon, we don't have, I forget who mentioned the level playing field. I think that was your comment, right? We need a level playing field. So right now, people are able to, whether it's in the transportation sector or the electric sector, they're able to put as much greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere with absolutely no cost because we do not have a limit on carbon pollution. So that's what's going to create the certainty in the market um, and give places like the Space Coast an opportunity where they're losing five or thank you. Losing five or 6,000 PhD jobs over in the Space Coast, and it's, I think, a natural shift uh, to make that a real centerpiece in, in our move toward reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Great. No, thank you. Sean, let's go back to the biomass side of the world. Um, what, uh, for, you've been involved in this for many years. What are the environmental benefits, and then what are some of the environmental issues that we need to address with, with biomass production in Florida? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ernie. The, uh, uh, the environmental benefits to biomass are, are, are really pretty simple. Biomass is, is, is not new. It's been, I was talking to Commissioner, Ag uh, Commissioner of Agriculture early this morning. Biomass has been around for quite some time uh, uh, in preparing food and in uh, 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 generating heat. Um, essentially, th there are several big components and environmental components of biomass that are key. One Biomass, when done sustainably and when done responsibly, uh, is a carbon neutral process. That is, you do not have a net uh, emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, the, uh, uh, the sustainability issue has become a little more forefront, uh, front and center the last, uh, the last few years, but uh, most of the clients that, uh, that I work with and represent have a, uh, 
have a, have a very sustainable model in place to ensure that uh, they don't have sort of a cut and run attitude. You don't, you don't go in and, and do a massive clear cut uh, to produce biopower without a, without a, uh, uh, a plan to, to sustainably harvest and cultivate. Um, there is a, uh, there's another added benefit, which is methane reduction. Um, today, uh, in Florida, if you, if you drive down uh, if you drive down the turnpike, and you're heading north or south down the turnpike, you will see a, a gargantuan trash mountain that's about 200 feet high. Um, a lot of the material in that, in that uh, landfill is biomass, and that is an unspent uh, energy uh, resource. It's an untapped energy resource that, that our state really hasn't tapped into yet by creating some sort of uh, uh, market certainty or incentives to utilize uh, utilize the either the wood waste or the uh, the MSW that that's in those uh, in those landfills. There are about uh, uh, there would be about a 13.2 million ton reduction of wood waste into landfills if Florida embraced a, a, a vibrant uh, renewable energy policy uh, that included biomass. And just so many of you know, biomass in Florida the definition is very similar to ha how it is in the federal statute. Biomass includes agricultural products, agricultural waste, uh, any kind of methane digestive uh, digester uh, process on a farm. Uh, biomass also includes uh, municipal solid waste and uh, waste heat from the sulfuric uh, manufacturing process. And uh, uh, there are tremendous opportunities. We, the first panel talked about job growth and the economic benefits. Uh, the same rings true for biomass. Uh, biomass. A biomass plant essentially keeps 85% of the dollars that it takes to put into the rate base within about a 50 to 75 mile uh, radius of that plant. That's to pay people to grow biomass, to transport it, to cultivate it, and uh, that economic benefit, you know, offsets what would ordinarily happen, which is, I guess, we've talked about the export of, of those dollars to other states and other countries that, that occur in a traditional fossil fuel plant. So. The economic development benefits are there with biomass. The environmental benefits uh, are there with biomass, especially when done in a sustainable fashion. And, you know, uh, frankly, you know, Florida is very well positioned to move forward on biomass because we have a, a very uh, uh, long-standing and, and very successful farming economy with a lot of economies of scale already built in. Uh, and we've got, uh, you know, just enormous potential for biomass. That's helpful. Uh, Jerry, I wanted to talk, I know you were involved as, as were virtually everyone on this panel in the 2008 energy legislation for the state of Florida, um, but how does that fit with our, our current strategy? Um, um, well, I, I think first, first of all is that it's important to note that the, that, that bill uh, passed unanimously through the House and Senate, and there's probably a couple of folks in Tallahassee um, in this room, and um, that's not a, a um, a usual occurrence. So, you know, I was listening with interest the last panel, um, you know, talking about, uh, you know, do we have the political will? Well, we already have done it. Um, and we haven't, you know, it ha wasn't a close call. It was, um, it was an, a, an overwhelming a majority um, of legislators saw the need to pass that bill. And that bill mentioned greenhouse gas reductions um, over 17 times. And in fact, the entire purpose of the bill was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I'd like to start off with, a, with just a question for the audience. Um, does anyone, uh, have, has anyone here heard of, uh, just raise your hands if you have, of Climate Gate? Who's heard of Climate Gate? Okay, all right, well, I, that's, I thought more of you all would have heard of it. Um, who, who, who has also heard that in uh, May, the National Academy of Sciences reaffirmed um, the science, the credibility of the science behind climate change? Does anybody hear of that report? Okay, I guess we have some folks follow the news. Um, and yesterday, um, the Climate Gators um, in London um, we're just vindicated. Who, who saw that in the news yesterday? Okay, well, that's good. Okay, uh, pretty, pretty even. <laughs> so it's a fair and balanced audience. Um, the, we don't want to, um, I mean, I don't want to take a risk um, that the National Academy of Sciences is dead wrong. Um, that's, uh, you know, we buy insurance for a lot higher risk, uh, I mean, for a lot lower risks than, uh, than that. So um, I think what's important when we look at renewable energy policy for Florida is does it reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, and does it prepare um, us for a low carbon economy? And you know, it's interesting as an environmentalist, um, being asked to be on the environmental panel, 
<laughs> because we, we almost, after these past couple of years working on this issue, we almost feel more comfortable on the economic panel um, because um, as Lin Lindsey Graham said the other day, um, there's not 60 votes in the United States Senate uh, to save the polar bear. Uh, but there is 60 votes in the United States Senate, we believe, um, to pass a bill that reduces energy independence, I mean, I mean reduces our dependence on, on foreign countries, um, that protects us from future oil spills, that has a renewable energy standard, um, and also uh, contains major provisions for economic growth and global competitiveness. We don't want to trade dependencies from OPEC to China. You know, we want to be building that stuff here. So I think it's, so we actually have a roadmap in 2008 um, from that bill because what that bill did, it created an energy research consortium, which has allowed us to receive more stimulus money than we might have had we not had it. It created a Florida Energy and Climate Commission um, which is also an important element for us to receive federal money and federal, federal grants along these, along these lines. It sent two nascent market signals for a renewable portfolio standard and a carbon cap in Florida um, that said that possibly in the future, if the legislature, legislature acted again, there would be a reward for renewable energy and low carbon technology in the market. Another important thing it did was it incentivized companies like Likes Brothers to invest in um, biofuels. Um, that, that bill held, had a mandate for ethanol production that was also supposed to phase into Florida-based ethanol production. So, and, and so the results of that bill, we didn't have to wait five or six years for those results to come in. We had to wait about a year and a half. We had three solar plant, we will almost have three solar plants built. We have an ethanol plant being built. Um, so we had a lot of energy efficiency components that have allowed for um, a company in Sarasota, My Green Buildings, um, to be the uh, fastest growing company in Sarasota, and that's in the housing development. So all of this was in the face of the worst economic recession that Florida ever experienced. What, but the problem was that bill was a down payment. That 2008 energy bill was meant to be followed up with certainty in the market. Um, and, and certainly, we don't want to bet that we're not going to find those 60 votes in the United States Senate because there's a lot of folks in this room and on this panel that are working hard to find them. Um, and that, that, that bill is going to contain a couple different elements. It's going to contain a renewable energy standard. It's going to contain some oil liability language and protection from oil spills in the future. And, it's going to and it possibly may contain a carbon cap. Uh, that's the only controversial part of the bill is the carbon cap. Um, but the renewable energy standard, if we don't have a policy in place before that get passes, because they will pass some sort of energy bill, but if we don't have a policy in place for the renewable energy standard, we're going to be paying for renewable energy credits out of the state of Florida. So it's very important that we act not next legislative session, but now uh, into, to one, be a part of this global market, see the benefits, um, but also protect uh, the people of Florida from our money going out of state. Thank you very much. John, I, I want to get your perspective from uh, both your, your kind of service at EPA um, and your current work, but I, but I also want you to specifically um, address, if you can, Senator Herodopoulos' question earlier about, what, talk to me about red tape, whether, particularly state red tape. Yes, I'll talk, talk a little bit about, uh, about red tape, uh, but I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of what we're, we're doing here today. Um, the, uh, I think it's um, it's no less critical than we are we are about whether we can sustain uh, a quality human human life and ecosystems on this planet um, for the future and uh, energy production and use is a tremendous part of that. Um, uh, when I was at EPA, I wish y'all could all have been with me in the helicopter as I flew over the uh, the mountaintop removal coal sites where there'd been a blowout and something that looked like a um, a viscous tar was flowing down down the river systems, um, um, you know, taking the tops of mountains and putting them in creeks. Um, um, of course, Eric talked about the uh, the oil impacts in the Gulf, which we, um, you know, directly affects Flex Florida. Um, sorry to be a little dramatic, but it is that important. And uh, 30 years ago, my first real job was working in the legislature on energy energy policy. And that was about the time that we had the first oil embargo. Um, uh, President Carter was um, uh, in his sweater in the White House and, and proposing the 
55 mile an hour speed limits and folks uh, poke fun at that, but he, he did accomplish a lot in terms of, of policy until the policy was effective enough to drive oil prices back down to $15 a barrel and, you know, we went back to sort of our, our old ways. Um, but I think it's critical that Florida lead a new industrial policy and I think environmental, um, uh, the environmental processing of these technologies is, is a, a critical element, Ernie. I, um, um, you know, the, we, we understand very vividly right now the impacts of our, our current uh, fossil fuel-based uh, energy systems. Um, but we also need to, to um, be thoughtful as we look at these, these other sources. And I'm very much about not, not saying either or. You know, it's not, it's not biomass or solar or wind or nuclear. It's how can we use all of these uh, technologies that, that have, have their strengths and weaknesses and appropriateness in this state in the best way to try to create a sustainable energy future. Um, that's what's wonderful about this conference is we have that kind of talent. Um, I'm thinking about the Senator's uh, question. Um, it occurs to me that perhaps um, as, as we go forward as part of your legislation, Senator, perhaps you should identify more or less an ombudsman or perhaps a, 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 study, a study group or, or some uh, as part of your industrial policy for Florida to promote renewable energy that would look at the, uh, at the regulations and how, how they, they need to be adapted to um, evaluate, evaluating these new sources of energy. I mean, a solar, solar field is much different than a, a coal-fired power plant, and, um, you know, and it's also true in rate making. Um, you know, if you, Eric Szilagyi said the, the most en encouraging and, and uh, um, heartwarming for me thing is that the cheapest energy that we can produce is energy that doesn't have to be produced that you've saved um, through conservation. And uh, I think a lot of our policies work against that right now, and we need to find ways to improve that. So I think some attention on that would be very, very appropriate as you move, move forward here in the state of Florida. Thanks. Just to give the panel, we're, we're probably 35% uh, into our, our comments. I, I, as I told you guys before, we got a lot of people, we got to keep our comments. So what I want to do, I think Susan's got to follow up to that one, and then I've got, a, I've got another question uh, actually for you, Jerry. I just wanted to, to pick up on something John said about, and mentioned earlier about the, the cheapest and the cleanest and the fastest is that kilowatt that we don't use. We really have, in many ways, our utility regulation is sort of misaligned. It, we are, uh, the utilities are incentivized to build new power plants because that's how they're, they make money. They make money on a return on equity. So there are 17 states in the U.S. that capture either a percent or a percentage and a half of energy efficiency. And Florida's at 0.25. And we could be doing so much more. We actually just came through the, the FECA proceeding, the Florida Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, and two of the groups that, that I work with was involved in those proceedings, and we sort of had to fight a bit tooth and nail. Um, in fact, we just looked at some of the filings in that, and, and for instance, uh, Duke in the Carolinas and in Arizona, they get one or two cents a kilowatt hour for energy efficiency, and we just looked at filings that had progress energy at $1.36 per kilowatt hour of energy efficiency. Now, again, we've just gotten a hold of those filings, so that's something people need to look at. So we don't need to, I think a lot of this conversation has been focused on sort of particular aspects of renewable energy. We need an overall robust plan. We need to capture every single piece of energy efficiency that's cost effective, that costs less than new generation. We need to do that. And, and the ironic thing is it all happens at the same time. So you sort of think about it in that chronology, but you, you have to do that while you're developing the new renewables. And Jerry Carnes made uh, a very important point that we may very well likely have a federal renewable electricity standard. So the fact that we have dragged our heels for the last couple years and not put in a Florida policy means we're going to be at the whim of, of what they give us federally. So we're going to end up sending money, you know, for wind in Oklahoma when we could be by, you know, making that homegrown energy, creating jobs right here at home. And this is happening literally this month. So I would add that we need to act in a special session and we need to act now for the, the economy's interest. Jerry, that's actually kind of funny. It leads in pretty well. The, the question you'd raised earlier about the uh, 
how FESC, having the Florida Energy Systems Consortium, I know we have some of those folks here with us in the audience today uh, and on panels, um, but how is it that Florida's current policy actually helps us with a federal policy, and particularly this issue of bringing federal dollars to Florida? Well, I'm sorry. It actually helped us get stimulus money, but um, the, uh, the, having that energy structure in place for us allow, allowed for us to um, get more of our share for stimulus dollars. I know it's a controversial policy, um, but we did get a tremendous amount of um, money for energy. Um, we also um, were able to build a um, battery plant, lithium-ion battery plant in Jacksonville, who I think is being under construction now, um, which actually took the footprint of an old naval, um, a part of the naval base um, in Jacksonville that, um, um, that, that had been decommissioned. And so, you know, we, we, our Florida Energy and Climate Commission was able to give money to our algae, um, you know, algae interests um, and, and a bunch of different agricultural interests uh, through the, the leadership of uh, Commissioner Bronson. So, I mean, that's just one part of it. Um, the, the idea is, you know, when you have a carbon market, um, eventually nationally, um, which we believe is gonna happen very soon, that you don't have to use taxpayer do m dollars anymore. Um, you're using the allowance value um, to ensure that consumers are protected, but also to ensure that research and development um, is spurred throughout the 50 states. So it's, um, I just, it, it's, it's not something we want to bet on um, that we're not going to get an energy bill um, out of Washington because, you know, when John Kerry and Joe Lieberman and unfortunately Senator Graham couldn't be there um, because of other issues, um, but when they released that bill, you know, the CEO of, of my company, um, Environmental Defense Fund, was there. He was standing alongside of the CEO of Florida Power and Light, uh, where Next Era Energy now, um, uh, Lou Hay. Um, you know, in fact, they've done meetings. You know, they go into meetings together with senators. Um, this is not a controversial um, component, and we're very, very close to um, to pushing this policy in place. So I would say that you know, it's it's critical um, that Florida, you know, one begin to prepare for what's likely definitely going to happen, which is a national renewable energy standard combined with um, some, some, some other elements. But we also wouldn't want to bet against the fact that some sort of price on carbon is going to happen. Um, and so, you know, we want to look at things through the filter of um, economic growth, and, but also does it reduce carbon emissions. Um, you know, there's a real sweet spot here, and I think we hit that sweet spot in 2008, um, where energy independence, economic growth, and global competitiveness combine with environmental protection interests um, to create a very large coalition. Um, we certainly have that coalition here in Florida. Um, on this issue, there's been a real melding of industry, agriculture, and environmental interests already for the past couple of years around the issue, and it's also happening in Washington. Um, so it's, um, you know, we have a huge opportunity um, you know, here for, with solar and agriculture and other areas to compete very well, um, but we need to move forward. And just lastly, I don't know if anybody heard on NPR this morning, but some guy just flew 24 hours in the air around the world in a solar plane. Um, I don't know if I would want to be the co-pilot on that deal, but <laughs> the, um, I mean, I don't even like, you know, taking JetBlue to Washington, but the, it's, um, I mean, he, you know, the, but the fact remains, the guy was in the air for 24 hours in, while it was dark, too, um, in a solar plane. So if we can do that, um, I think certainly we can um, start to expand our use of renewable energy in the state of Florida. Eric, if, if you could talk for a minute about, uh, I know you all have done some research on, on kind of fuel diversification and the impacts from an environmental perspective of different types of fuel in Florida. If you could talk for a few minutes about that. Well, first of all, Ernie, I want to say that there's no environmental impact from solar. So, I mean, I don't see why you need to go f further than that. I, I noted that, um, that we had this uh, discussion about the 2008 bill, and there was actually something that came out of that in terms of actual having renewable on the ground, and that is that uh, more than uh, 100 megawatts of solar was actually, you know, put in, installed, paid for on the ground, and paid for with a policy that actually works, which is cost recovery. So, you know, we, we have moved forward on a policy that, uh, that actually works, and I think that we need to not only anticipate the things that we need, but we need to count the things that have already been done. And um, I don't think that anyone should discount the value of those solar panels that are out there right now producing real energy in Florida's hot summer and helping to, uh, to put, uh, put juice on the grid to, uh, 
to cool our homes and to uh, run our businesses. And the most important part about that in terms of, of an environmental impact is there is no fuel cost, so there's no mountaintop mining to do um, uh, solar panels. There's no uh, drilling for oil in our Gulf of Mexico in order to produce that. Uh, uh, there is no emission uh, associated with it. Nothing is burned um, uh, in, in with those solar panels. So if you're, if you're looking at it purely from the point of view, if you just didn't want to have any environmental impacts other than taking some land, and frankly, we've got a lot of land in Florida, this, this fallow land right now, that could be used for something else with the uh, unfortunate reduction of our citrus uh, industry, uh, you know, some of the conversion of other landscapes. It makes sense to, to, uh, to have these solar installations. Again, no environmental impact other than the fact that landform is being used. Then Ernie did fully answer the question, and particularly since my good friend Sean is sitting next to me, um, I want to say that, that Sean's company, Florida Crystals, is producing and has been producing over a long period of time um, a very valuable source of uh, round-the-clock uh, energy. And that makes a great deal of sense, as Sean has talked about, which is with very, very low uh, environmental impact. And, and, and although, you know, we kind of fight the sugar industry a little bit on some other issues, have actually become fairly good stewards of the landscape. Quote me on that one. Uh, Sean, <laughs> <laughs> um, and 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 we're seeing you know a renewable food source, uh, a, a good use of a landform, uh, and a good use of a of an otherwise agricultural uh, waste product. So that makes a great deal of sense. Um, on the on the rest of the issues, I th I think that in terms of of additional production of environmental impacts from production of additional. Uh, biofuels. Uh, we've got production going on right now with the waste to energy plants in different places. They've really been able to bring down with waste to energy and with uh, new technologies like plasma arc have been able to significantly bring down um, the environmental impacts from air quality. I remember when there was first the discussion of waste to energy, there was a lot of concern about air quality, but air quality impacts have been brought down. Those are the big uh, three. I think the most important thing we do, Ernie, is that we, and I think that we all look at this, is we look at what's working right now. And we know that we've seen solar put onto the grid. We know that we've got, you know, uh, Florida Crystals uh, putting energy onto the grid. We know that we've got some of the waste energy folks putting stuff on the grid. Let's let's advance the stuff that's already working. Great. Let me move back down to John because uh, something Eric mentioned I thought was kind of interesting. This concept of plasma arc. Uh, uh, John has been involved in, in permitting a plasma arc facility in St. Lucie County. If you could talk a little bit about that facility and its potential for the state of Florida. Well, uh, plasma arc is kind of a, um, a, a technology that, that's that spun off of um, a technology that was developed to test the heat shield. Susan talked about the, uh, um, the cape, and, and uh, essentially it, it creates extremely hot temperatures. Essentially, if you think of it as lightning, sort of captured and, and used to create a very high heat. Uh, one of the things that, that was a problem when, when I was at EPA was uh, at that time some of the waste to energy uh, facilities were not getting high enough temperatures and there were, there were uh, byproducts that were produced in connection with the uh, mass burn facilities that weren't properly uh, um, taken out of the airstream and uh, um, plus they, they had some issues with, with, with their ash. Um, the plasma arc, uh, using this uh, sort of lightning in the bottle uh, approach, it's pretty simplistic. I'm, I'm not a scientist, uh, but uh, we can, uh, I know people who are. I can give you more detail if you're interested, but uh, it creates high enough temperature so you're essentially gasifying, not, not burning uh, the material that, that comes, uh, comes through the process. And you have a feedstock that not only uh, doesn't cost you any money, but people want to get rid of. Um, when you look at landfills in Florida particularly, the, uh, the impacts of landfills both on the air from, from methane and, and off-gassing uh, from a greenhouse gas standpoint and from a water quality standpoint is significant. So if we can develop uh, environmentally uh, safe alternatives to that, we can also create good, good uh, renewable energy uh, from the process. I think it has a lot of promise. Thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, speaking of new technologies and kind of uh, specific things, I know your, your company is working on cellulosic ethanol. Mm -hmm. Uh, project with the University of Florida. Could you tell us a little bit about that and what you think its potential is for the state? Sure. I think um, whether it is cellulosic ethanol or um, 
uh, biopower or nuclear or some of the other things that are mentioned here. I think what's um, unique about what we're hearing on this panel and, and what we heard before is how the economic issues are so closely related to the environmental issues. And I think it's the economics of the different types of power, different different crops or, or whatever it is that are going to be the real driver in, in, in building this industry. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's just interesting to see how that's starting to evolve um, throughout you know, different parts of the, the state, uh, different parts of the, the, the country. And what's really special about Florida is we have a very large population um, generally along, along the coast, but then we have these large rural areas that are, that are very close to them and the economic benefits of, of having that large available farmland very near a a population are that we don't have to then transport that that fuel whether it's ethanol or it's uh, power in a power line and the economic uh, and environmental benefits are, are just really tied together um, on on those issues um, specifically when you're talking about uh, cellulosic ethanol or biopower uh, you know say in North Florida from a forestry application or or um, um, more the, the ethanol production that, that we're talking about, the benefits of actually putting the uh, processing facility on the farm, on this specific forest. The economics are what drive that and make, and make sense because you're not having to haul the material so far, but the environmental benefits that you get from that are the ability to reuse water from this facility because it's, it's right there on the farm and the savings uh, fr from that are tremendous, both in, from an economic standpoint and an environmental standpoint. Great, thank you. Um, let me ask uh, uh, Sean a question about uh, the potential you think for, for further developing the, uh, the biomass industry in Florida. I know Commissioner Bronson's got his farm to fuel conference coming up, um, but what are your thoughts on that? Where do you think this can go for us? Well, I think you, if you look back two years ago when the Public Service Commission was, uh, was studying the, uh, uh, a renewable policy, they essentially commissioned a study by a company called Navigant Consulting. And Navigant came to, uh, they came to the conclusion that in Florida, relatively, uh, relatively cheaply, you could uh, easily double or triple uh, what you have today on the ground uh, as far as biomass power goes. Today, the percentage, I believe, of, of what uh, uh, bio provides the state in total energy production is around 2%. So you're looking at probably somewhere about increasing biomass to anywhere from you know, 4% in a few years to 6%, possibly 8 and even 10%, depending on the, uh, the economics and how they work. So there's, a, there's enormous potential. Uh, there's also, I mean, there, there's, a, there, there's also availability of feedstock in Florida because of our favorable growing climate, because of uh, our favorable soils and obviously the, the, the uh, agriculture industry. There was uh, an estimate put out by the uh, Florida Department of Agriculture that there was uh, around, a uh, potential of around 92 million dry tons of biomass. And, and to put that into a little bit of perspective, uh, down at Florida Crystals, for example, at, at uh, their renewable energy plant, they burn about a million tons of sugarcane bagasse and augment that with around a million tons of municipal solid wood waste that comes from a variety of counties in South Florida and Southwest Florida. Those waste streams uh, come into the plant and provide uh, the, the fuel stock for that, for that power to be generated. So there, there's a lot of potential. Melissa, we've talked a little bit about how, how you pull these pieces together and uh, the concept of kind of multi-use projects and how you might go about getting multi-use projects put together. You know, when I look at environmental policy in the state of Florida, clearly the focus here today is on energy and renewable energies, green technologies, those types of things. But my other hat is focused on water resources, Everglades restoration. Um, and when you look at the things that are coming down the pipe, like Everglades restoration, the challenges we have in terms of budgets and implementing this incredible restoration project that will benefit the whole world, as well as water quality regulations and TMDLs and things like this that we're looking at, how in the world are we ever going to fund these things? I think 
I don't envy the legislature having to deal with how to fund those issues as well as the issues that we're talking about today. But to me, I think we need a greater vision for Florida. And that's looking at the state and looking at it strategically and ways where we can combine these needs and focus on multi-use projects. How great, I mean, we have two we have two people on the panel who represent very large landowners. How great would it be if they were able to propose a project that had multiple benefits? Not only was a green technology or green energy um, focus, but also somehow intertwined uh, some Everglades components, water storage. I'm dumping right now, not me personally, for the record. <laughs> we are dumping hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gallons of water to tide every day or every year. How can we capture that and use it for water supply for green crops? How can we capture that and actually address all of these multiple problems that we have to face as a state as we move forward? So that's where I would challenge um, the, the vision going forward. Let's think about things differently. Let's prioritize projects that actually accomplish multiple uses. Maybe that's where your innovative funding comes in. I've got a, a question, Sean. You, you're, you've got a fan out here asking you a specific question. Um, can you discuss, uh, I'll add this briefly, uh, the economics of biomass, especially how do you deal with the costs of doing a biomass plant? Well, the costs of doing a biomass plant differ based on whether you're taking an existing plant uh, that, that essentially uses current economies of scale built in and, and you add a biomass boiler. Uh, that can be done fairly cost effectively probably uh, if you were to put it in a range of cents per kilowatt hour, you know, anywhere from, you know, probably, I get in trouble if I guess wrong, but anywhere from probably four to eight, depending on the technology you would use. Um, if you build a standalone biomass plant, the, the costs are going to, uh, the costs are going to exceed that, uh, the, the costs of, you know, securing the land. You would have to get a long-term land lease uh, on a substantial uh, amount of acres. Uh, or purchase the land, uh, which might be a better option in today's economy, um, you, would, uh, you would then have to go through a very, uh, very expensive uh, process of uh, securing uh, engineering firms and, and, and going through a, a, a permitting process that, uh, that, that would take probably a few years uh, from, from start to finish. Uh, but in the end, you would probably end up with something that costs ultimately about 14 cents a kilowatt hour, maybe up to 16 cents to, to install. But there's a big difference, between, big difference between building a standalone plant that has no current infrastructure and then adding to existing infrastructure today and taking that infrastructure, uh, building, building in economies of scale and uh, essentially financing the add-ons over a long, uh, uh, long period of time. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, no one specifically for this one, but Taking into consideration the total net environmental impact of renewable energy, a concept we've talked a little bit about, which technology has the better life cycle environmental costs? Anyone want to take a shot at that one? Eric? All right. Yeah, I'm, I think I tried to make this point earlier, but I'll say it again, and I think Jerry just made a good point on it, which is that, uh, you know, once you've gone through the initial manufacturing installation of solar, I mean, you're, you're dealing with something that's... Uh, it has a very long life cycle. There's, there's no fuel cost associated with them, which is, of course, the, the most important environmental question because we know and we're seeing right now uh, that, the, that the biggest environmental disaster that we've dealt with in the United States ever is the Gulf oil uh, spill, which is a direct result of trying to fulfill our need to have energy fuels. And uh, so, you know, in terms of, of life cycle for solar, you would never have that problem. You would never have the mountaintop mining problem that John's talking about. And although my organization is not, uh, is not taking a position one way or the other on nuclear energy, but you don't have any of the environmental effects of nuclear, which is, uh, you know, has some waste issues and you've got some, definitely some water consumption issues. So, um, you know, there are, you have to look at the, the environmental cost of the other technologies. Even with, even though we are a supporter of biomass, and we're supportive of the new biomass technologies, we, we do have to look, and I want to credit, by the way, Melissa for making a very good comment, Melissa, about trying to integrate our water solutions with these proposals to deal with, with biomass. Because if, in fact, we can, we can do things the way that Melissa is talking about it, we can actually end up with biomass removing not just, not just managing our water supply better 
in the Lake Okeechobee watershed, the Northern Everglades watershed, but we could actually use energy crops to maybe remove some of the phosphorus, which is in the watershed right now, which would go a long way to actually solve a problem. We could do what, what we definitely need to do, which was to en enlist the landowners, the Florida Crystals and the likes and the others in helping to solve these problems rather than just imposing uh, solutions uh, on them. We're doing good. You guys are keeping your answers short so we can get through a bunch of these. Next question. Um, do you see an increasing role for using brownfield sites uh, and or fallow agriculture for renewable energy production? I think we talked a little bit about the fallow ag lands. Uh, anybody want to take a shot at brownfield site? John? Well, just briefly, and, and uh, I'm sure Melissa and, and others have worked on that, but um, that's a very good idea in terms of lands that are available uh, that already have some challenge to them. If you take a um, one, one very interesting initiative going on in Atlanta, for example, is the, uh, the old Ford plant is uh, now being, being re, uh, reclaimed in, into use. And, and one of the big goals of the, uh, the new owners is to uh, make it a solar energy facility. Um, a parking garage, of course, it's got to be parking if it's next to the uh, Hartsville Airport. But on top of all those parking structures would be a big, big solar, solar installation. So I, I think there's a lot, a lot uh, we need to look at it, at reusing properties that, that are somehow uh, been contaminated and cleaned up to a level that they could be used for this purpose. Here's the next question. Uh, what happens to solar panels once their useful life is over? Can they then be recycled? Anybody know the answer to that one? <laughs> Jerry? Well, if we have a policy in place, we'll at least get to rebuild the solar plant, um, you know, with new panels. Okay. I mean, my guess is the stuff that's in them. Well, yeah, I mean, they are. Parts of yeah, we'll have to ask. Yeah, we'll the, get the aluminum frame, all that stuff is, <laughs> I think the, the, the silica inside the solar panel is what actually degrades over time. And okay. so uh, that usefulness, I think, is, 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 is over with. But I defer to some of the uh, multitude of solar guys yeah, in the room. Right. For that. I, think, I think that's one of the things we, we turn over to our friends in the university community, that's coupled with our, uh, our Semitech representative from this morning. Uh, that sounds like another growth industry. Let me move on. We've got time, I think, for two more before we break for lunch. Um, what are the typical environmental permitting requirements for a renewable project? And I know they change depending upon what type. Uh, but let's, let's take a biomass project, typical permitting requirements. You have to do that one. Joe? Yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> depending on if it's, you know, cellulosic ethanol or biopower or, um, you know, whatever that is, it's, uh, it's a myriad of state, uh, local, as well as federal... Um, permits. I mean, the uh, you know federal air uh, emissions permits, the uh, the state uh, environmental resource permitting, water use permitting, um, and the, as well as depending on again the 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 crop and the farm. Um, there are Department of Agriculture uh, permits. There are um, Army Corps of Engineer permits. Uh, you can you know. Once you get on the federal side, then you're talking about threatening endangered species um, and, and the whole myriad of things. And then that is just county by county then, depending on you know, what the, 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 the myriad of county regulations are. Uh, and that, that varies widely uh, in, in Florida. Okay, last question we're gonna take. And then uh, the question is, how does this job creation, uh, energy production, um, how, how do you compare, and it's a PV question, the, the, Comparing a large PV facility to distributed solar energy rooftops. Um, uh, Susan, you want to take a shot at that? Well, I think sort of the answer to that is that we have to do it all. Um, this is not to suggest that you're only going to do a rooftop PV to the exception of the large solar farms, but we can't do the large solar farms to the exception of doing the rooftop. And I, you know, I'm a girl with a with a broken heart, and it's, it's not a statement on my love life at all. It is a statement on the jobs that we have missed in the state of Florida over the last few years. Um, not a day goes by that someone doesn't call me with a project that was going to happen. The University of Florida, the Energy Systems Consortium, also almost on a daily basis have companies inquiring about Florida that are going to go elsewhere because we don't have a renewable portfolio standard, some sort of a target in place. So it's not just enough to allow for additional cost recovery for some number of, of, of big projects. And the interesting silver lining on this is that because the South has been so slow to move, that if we move 
immediately, hopefully before there's a federal renewable electricity standard in place, we can still be a leader in the South. And part of this interesting game is not only are we competing with other states, but we're competing with the rest of the world. And people have, have referenced that, but we're competing with India and China. So the jobs, energy efficiency jobs, I talked about energy efficiency and that we're not doing very well. Those are the fastest jobs that we can get where people are gonna come and the people who have been displaced, uh, we talked about growth, Senator, you talked about growth being one of those stools, so we're not developing. But those same people, those construction folks that are without jobs can go in and change out those windows and put in that insulation. So that's a tremendous amount of jobs, Ernie. That would really, really help us and of course you get jobs with the big projects, but once they're done, they're done. So that's why we need this broader, robust market, and we need to do it right now. Senator? And I, I think that's an excellent point. Again, that's the opportunity cost. There's, there's no doubt about it. And just to put a, a few things out there, I know the f folks in the press are here as well. You know, sometimes a lot of these arguments get so simplistically cast. Uh, the, head, the headline carries today, and so should we go to the cost recovery models we've always been talking about the last few years, that it could be a dollar or two dollars a month to start making these changes, as the bill last year talked about, or at least last session. Uh, we need to look at the total cost. And I was just doing this some simple math, and I know someone did some earlier, but you know, if gasoline goes up 10 cents a gallon, if it goes from 260, which I roughly paid their day, to 270, that's an extra eight dollars a month in my family. And that's $96 a year. More likely when we see the gas costs go up to 25 cents, probably more a gallon, that's $240 a year. So there are real costs associated with this in addition to the accords, the unemployment. So I think one of the things that we're gonna look at a total cost, not just on the recovery side, but just the total cost of what it means to the state. I, I hope that the press will do its part, that they look at the big picture, not just a myopic view that, that sells newspapers. Because when you look at what happened in California with the semiconductor plants that were talked about earlier, that dramatically changed our nation. You talk about what they're doing right now, we're going to hear about it at lunch in Texas. That dramatically changed their economy. It wasn't a good 30-second soundbite, but it was sound long-term policy that the next generation deserves. And so I think it's also incumbent upon us, all of us who are here today, if we're going to take this chance and invest like we are, I consider an investment if you choose to go this route, that we have to discuss it in adult terms and not play politics with it because of one aspect which we're talking about. Because in my mind, 40,000 Floridians working means a lot to me. This is about jobs, this is about anything else. And when people are, have a, a mission in life and they go to work every day, as opposed to being a ward of the state. And so when we see gasoline prices uh, grow, when we see some of these costs, I hope that we can all be adults in the room when we talk to people and say, hey, let's look at the big picture, not just the short-term results. It's the same reason when, you're, when your children get out a little out of the hand, you just don't give them a piece of candy and they walk away. You, you want to make sure you learn a lesson from it and make sure that the future is brighter than at that immediate moment. So I'm really grateful for all the panelists making their opinions known. It really helps us as we move in a policy direction. But I hope we can all take from this today that, remember, we can't get away with this simplistic argument anymore. It's a very complex argument, and that's what the future is all about. And, and that's the only way we're going to have sustainable long-term energy policy that works so we won't get stuck in the politics that has really uh, yielded poor results in the past. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization.